My name is Diana Shepard, and I'm the editorial director and co-founder of Divorce Magazine and a facilitator here at the Divorce School. Today, I'll be speaking with Peggy L. Tracy, who is a certified fraud examiner, as well as a certified divorce financial analyst who has conducted more than 100 marital fraud investigations. She's here today to talk about divorce-related fraud, warning signs that your spouse may be stealing your future, and what you can do to prevent or to stop fraud in its tracks. Welcome, Peggy. Thank you, Diana. It's great to be on today. Peggy, can you tell us what specific types of fraud apply to divorcing people? If we talk about the definition of divorce or the definition of fraud, which is the deliberate or intentional attempt to deceive somebody of money, property, or other means, then you could see how any type of fraud could, could apply to divorce. I've seen cases with mortgage fraud, securities fraud, forgeries, and some of these we'll talk about later. Um, a very specific type of fraud that applies to divorce is known as dissipation. As people move through the, the divorce process, they can be on a real emotional roller coaster with intense feelings of anger, sadness, guilt, betrayal, the whole gamut. So those feelings could lead people to believe that their spouse is trying to trick them um, or to hide assets from them. So I guess I'm wondering, how common is marital fraud really? And that's an excellent question. Marital fraud is rampant. Um, it can come down to threatening your spouse about the finances. It can come down to lying and deceiving your spouse about the finances. It can come down to withholding um, important or pertinent information about your finances with your spouse. Any of these types of, of areas could lead to somebody starting to take money and either hide it or start to spend it inappropriately. Peggy, what situations could make committing fraud easier than others? One of the biggest areas that can cause fraud to occur is really having just one set of eyes on the family finances. If you've set up your, your traditional duties so that one of, the, one of the spouses controls all the finances from depositing the checks to actually um, working out all the bills and making all the big decisions and doing all the tax returns, then you've put yourself in a prime spot for fraud to occur because there's nobody overseeing the basic family finances. Um, and sometimes just knowing that a second set of eyes is looking can be a big deterrence to fraud. Hey, can you tell us a little bit about general versus specific dissipation claims? I sure can, Diana. This is, this is my opinion from being an expert witness in court. And what I have found is that when I have items of transaction that are directly related to bad behavior or money being spent outside of the marriage, I have a lot more likelihood of bringing that into a claim for dissipation um, than I do for like a general dissipation. For instance, in a, a case where um, this particular spouse had been spending money on a, an illicit affair and he actually paid her law school tuition as well as her rent, her car repair bills, and her dental bills as well. And we were able to directly trace those to the fact that he wrote checks out right to those institutions or people on her behalf. The other bills that came in were things like restaurants and gas stations and items where it, it was likely that he was in the neighborhood, but we couldn't directly pin that dissipation onto him. So it's more of a general area, and often general dissipation does not get picked up in a claim because it's too, it's not specific enough. Let's talk about the warning signs that fraud may have been occurring during the marriage, particularly as a couple starts going down the road to divorce. What are some of the red flags that they should look out for to maybe give them a clue that something, something has been going on that shouldn't have been going on? What should they look for? Oh, there are many, many red flags often when you look back at evidence that was, in, that was there all the time, but all of a sudden it looks, in, you look at it in a different eye when you start to see that you put the whole 
puzzle of the financial pieces together um, and you find that money is hidden or missing. Red flags can be circumstantial evidence or it could be direct evidence. Um, circumstantial evidence are, are sort of hunches. They're items that, that are changes in pattern, irregularities, things that don't fit together or someone isn't doing things the way they used to do it. For instance, there could be changes in secrecy um, where somebody's not sharing their day with you like they would before because now they can't share their day with you because they're doing something that they shouldn't be doing. Um, there are changes in lifestyle often. Um, we always look back and, and joke that, you know, somebody joins a health club and loses 100 pounds. It might be because they're having an affair. Um, and quite often that is the case. <laughs> so there might be changes in somebody's daily routine or daily habits um, that, again, taken in and of itself doesn't really mean very much. But when you look at it as part of a change of overall pattern, it does become pretty um, important. And then there are also the big direct evidence changes that I call them, changes in income, assets, and debts. For instance, if all of a sudden somebody is accruing a debt on their credit card where years before they used to pay it off every month and now they can only pay a monthly minimum balance, something has happened. So that change in debt situation right away would alert me that something is, is changing. Perhaps we, we, they've gotten into some gambling, perhaps there's something else going on there, but those kinds of things uh, alarm me because normally people's income, their assets are pretty predictable. You can determine based on a given year what your income might be. You can determine how your asset growth is going to be. And when these items get disturbed because someone is manipulating the money or lying and taking the money out, then all of a sudden you find that there are big changes and, and movement in these items that, what, that wasn't there before. Um, another key, key feature I found is when somebody says that they're working more hours um, and you expect to see their income to be higher, and in reality, what happens is that because they're maybe having an affair, their income is actually lower and they're working less hours. Um, so there are lots of integral pieces to this financial puzzle that when you put them all together between the circumstantial and the direct evidence, you can find a whole series of red flags. It's usually more than one. Now, I'm guessing that the greater number of red flags there are, the more likely that fraud is to have occurred. However, could one red flag, if it's serious enough, be really enough to tell you that there is a problem? Yes. I had one case where a woman was going through their documents and she found that they had five college plans set up and they only had three children. So she only needed one red flag at that point to explain to her that there was something definitely wrong with this situation um, and that he had a double life that he was not telling her about. Peggy, if someone is pretty sure that money or other assets are inexplicably missing, what can they do to confirm their suspicions and hopefully get those assets back? Okay, well, the first, the first line of defense to me is to start to become aware of transparency and understanding that every, that every marriage is a partnership and whether something is in an individual name or a joint name, that because we are in a partnership, all finances theoretically should be transparent. Now, when someone is hiding money or deceiving people or giving money to family members or friends or whoever it might be, then their transparency is gone because they don't want you to find out about it. Um, secrecy is a big part of uh, marital fraud. However, if you talk with your tax advisors and you talk with your investment advisors, because you are you know, working jointly with a married partner, you have access to those advisors on an individual basis who can actually take you and walk you through your finances um, if you don't understand what to look for. That would be my first thing, with to, is to bring other people into the mix so that you can now start to get a sense of what your finances look like. Because as I've said before, a second set of eyes is often the deterrence that people need in order not to commit fraud. Um, you also need to become very, very fluent with understanding your debt situation. How many credit cards do you have? What's your mortgage balance? Um, what kind of retirement accounts do you have? What are your investment accounts? 
Um, oftentimes and too often, I see people come in and where one of the spouses are just completely ignorant and not because they're not smart. It's because the other spouse decided to take control of those finances. And when you take control of something, you eliminate the other party. Um, so a lot of times it's just a question of my clients haven't been educated in the finances until they get the till they get divorced. So it's a problem. If you suspect your spouse of being fraudulent, what steps can you take to protect your financial future? Well, the first item would be that you need to have a voice. Um, it's impractical in this world not to understand what types of investments you have, what types of um, what your taxes look like. It's inconceivable to also say that you just didn't know that a lot of this behavior was going on when actually that it is going on. If other people are telling you items and you're not listening to them, um, if there's a disconnect somewhere in your marriage and in your life, then you're going to find that a lot of spouses are allowed to be fraudulent simply because we're not being vigilant enough. You can do surveillance, you can hire a forensic accountant, um, you can, uh, like I said, build a team of people to, to make sure that your spouse is honest if there's any question. What can you tell us about marital fraud prevention and remediation? Well, marital fraud prevention, if two people have an open communication um, and there is transparency in the finances, most of the time, a fraud will not occur. Um, marital fraud prevention also says we sit down and we have quarterly meetings. We talk about how much money is it that we each can spend before we have to consult the other person. It's much more of a partnership on the, on the family funds as opposed to I make the money, I, you know, I spend the money kind of an attitude. Um, whenever you're dealing with a power play, in the marriage, it's going to show up in finances. Now, remediation, those are areas where there are certain remedies that you can take to make sure that what's happened in the past with your finances may not happen in the future. For instance, there are protective orders that can be taken out in court orders. There are orders that you can have to freeze assets, which we've had to do in a number of divorces because the bad behavior would continue on even though the divorce had been filed. Um, so sometimes the court has to slap somebody's hands. Um, most of the time, attorneys will <clears throat> understand what remediation is necessary, and they will file the papers, and they will take steps to protect people. Sometimes it might even be setting up an escrow account if you have a big asset that's being sold in the divorce so that nobody gets the money at this point. Instead, it sits with the attorneys, and it gets divvied up later. There are a lot of different choices here that we have to take steps and make sure that whatever fraud was occurring in the past gets stopped and then it won't occur in the future. Peggy, can you offer a few more real life examples of how fraud can occur in a marriage and what people can do to safeguard their financial futures? Well, and that's what it's really all about. Um, I have seen cases of a fraud where money has been given unknowingly to other family members. Um, I have seen cases where overspenders or spendaholics are part of the marriage. Um, in one case, um, one of the spouses spent about $40,000 in credit card debt uh, and they went ahead, they went to therapy, they paid it off. She went ahead and again did it. Um, this time he had her use an inheritance to pay it off. And then she went and did it again and this time he filed for divorce. She was ruining his financial future, and there was no way, even though he still loved her, that they could stay married. Um, I have found a lot of interesting, a lot of interesting frauds. Um, in one case, one man was gambling quite heavily, and he he worked at a bank, so he took a hundred thousand dollar equity line against his house and forged his wife's signature and gambled all the money away. Um, and when they came to collect the money from her. Um, she obviously was an innocent spouse and had no idea this had happened, filed for divorce right away, um, and he went to work for another bank and she got her divorce. Um, there are some interesting frauds that aren't illegal, but they're certainly unethical. Um, one of my favorite that I've already seen three times 
is people putting extra money with with taxes um, and overfunding their tax bills for various years and then not filing their taxes going back after they're divorced and then filing those and getting all of their tax money back. Um, there are cases where people set up shell companies and get very sophisticated in hiding their money. Um, and there are other people who just aren't very sophisticated about it at all and they're just literally giving money to their friends and the paper trail and the way we can find the money by going through their documents is pretty easy. Peggy, you've talked about the uh, the fraud triangle. I'm just going to bring up uh, a picture of that on, on the screen. And uh, I am wondering if you can say something about that. Can you see it now? I sure can. Thank you, Diana. Yes, the fraud triangle, it was invented in the 1940s um, by Dr. Cressy of Indiana University. And it was really when the beginning of white collar crime was starting to become something that, they, that people needed to deal with. Um, and basically what the fraud triangle states is that every one of us as a human being has various opportunities to commit fraud. We may feel various pressures to commit a fraud and we may be able to positively rationalize that fraud. The, 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 what, the reason the fraud triangle is important is because this discusses what we call a non-shareable need. So I may have something that I can't share with you. Let's say I have a gambling issue um, and I need to find a way to, to get the money to do my gambling. So what I'm going to do is apply the fraud triangle to that. I'm going to try to see if I can find a perceived opportunity, and it might be to open up another credit card in my name and put my address at my office so that my spouse wouldn't know anything about this particular credit card. Um, I, and I would also try to find other ways. I would be looking for cash advances and spending money off of a credit card, maybe looking at some ATM withdrawals um, and things like that in order to make the opportunity to commit this particular fraud. And then I would also have to feel some non-shareable pressure. If this gambling is an issue for me that I'm embarrassed about or I can't explain why I do it or I'm addicted to it, then that pressure is going to, is going to be another leg in the stool here that's going to say to me, let's go ahead and let's commit this fraud because I can't tell anybody about this. I have an addiction. I'm going to find the money and I'm going to go ahead and spend it on this. Um, and the rationalization, Diana, just occurs one time. Um, the first time we can we do something against our morals or something we know we're not supposed to be doing, you really have to kind of go through the yes, no, yes, no equation in your head. And what happens is that once somebody tries something, believe it or not, the second, and third, fourth time, it gets easier and easier. But just by committing that fraud the first time, there are some people who are known as a, just an occasional or accidental fraudster who might do this once and then realize after they've done it, this is not for them. There's a guilt element here that builds up um, over time. And other people become serial fraudsters and they realize, you know, wow, I got away with this. Let's see if I can get away with it again and again and again. So no matter what their bad behavior of choice might be, the, more, the fact that, that they're getting away with it is what's spurring them on to throw away the rationalization, and then they just go ahead and become fraudsters. My guest today has been Peggy Tracy, the owner of Priority Planning in Wheaton, Illinois. A certified fraud examiner and certified divorce financial analyst, she focuses on forensic accounting for matrimonial lawyers and their clients. For more information about fraud detection, you should visit her website at www.priorityplanning.biz. Peggy, thank you so much for offering this valuable information for us today, whether that sets someone's mind at ease or whether it convinces them that they need to take steps to protect their financial future. And thank you, Diana, for this opportunity. I appreciated it. We hope that you found this session helpful. We have many more podcasts and videos to share with you here at the Divorce School. In fact, you may have noticed that there's three videos right now showing at the bottom of your screen. If you want to click on one, you can follow that link and it will take you straight into your next class. Thank you so much for watching.